by little and by little, Dorothy Day. Well, um, I'm not real happy with this computer. It completely shut down in the midst of some amazing stuff. And I'm not surprised because there are spirit beings that think they have license over it, I'm sure, because of its use for negative things. And the song basically sang Your children are longing to share but they're afraid and they can go nowhere They don't know how to share the darkest thing they did and if you try you may do very good a hidden life is hard it drives us to a pleasure God. A hidden life is hard. It drives me to walk unconscious through every day. Conscious of only keeping out of my way, conscious of watching for the way, the children get free when they can skip to you or me and say, my heart is so heavy from what I've done. Please pray for me because my life has a hidden tree and it's growing dark and strange. Oh, come, help me tear down the tree of good blended with evil. I justified my trouble for too long. Papa, friend who loves Jesus, come and pray with me, because Yeshua's love and blood is so strong. Oh, I lived a hidden life, and you know it wasn't good walk with all those things that I knew I should share and how let someone help me carry them by 
that the lineage of my name had come to me, my friend. This you might call Confessions of the Illegitimate Child. You know, it's a really good thing not to cause a kid trouble by letting him, by preventing him from knowing that his daddy that has raised him is not his real daddy from the flesh and blood. And the farther away you are from the farm life, where you're with kids that see cool little hens squatting and roosters jumping on them and turkeys and bunnies and I mean my goodness the cows are quite an adventure um, and I worked on a stud farm at one point that was definitely something Full, full tilt entertainment. The whole neighborhood would come around and watch. Because it's fascinating. And it's cool. And in a while, out comes this baby horsey. Just from the little squirt from the, from the stud, you know. And I mean, it's no big deal to those kids. And they know their own forms and all that kind of stuff. But here we are in the city life. And you know what? Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence said about the city life, people that live in the cities have a very, very bad character. They don't have a noble character. And that's why when the Bedouins come through the city in the marketplace, sometimes the city girls just disappear with the Bedouins because they're, they're not just, you know, whatever, big and strong and et cetera, et cetera. They have, they, they have to be face to face with goats and dirt and, you know, they can't sit on a comfy chair. They can't surround themselves with flutes and entertainments of various sorts. And they don't care to. Their kind of enter entertainment they engage in themselves. They connect with themselves. And uh, it's a shame that we've got a culture of, you know, like these little scared audiences that, like, actually have so much ability like latent inside of them anyhow um oh my goodness layers and layers Yahweh you'll do it anyway Yahweh is a person Yahweh is a person and he told those people in the city of wholeness the people that dwell in the city of wholeness in Nehemiah 8 when they come back to build the city of wholeness and peace again the community of peace they come together and they separate themselves from the people who don't care to submit to the personality that is Yahweh. Um, that is actually the God of everybody. And that doesn't mean that God doesn't see people's hearts out of the outside of the visible righteous community, but the point is they separated themselves. They got serious. They were like, look, we're the family. You know, and it's all real here. It is all real in the family of peace and wholeness in my family it comes out on the table it's all real and that keeps us strong and thick and rich and wise and the children are wise as well so in Nehemiah 8 they separate themselves from others and the um, the, the grandpops tell the stories the sin stories the evil things that have happened to their family and to their father's family, and to their father's father's family. So basically, with everybody in attendance, you're hearing the wicked, nasty stuff that happens to people and the things that happen to them because they chose things that are selfish, that are more engaged in, you know, personal human rights than which go overboard into demands and entitlement and selfishness rather than obedience to Yahweh, which is also a right <laughs> source. So they confess their sins and the sins of their fathers. 
and the children learn. Well, remember, so-and-so stole money, and they started that business, and the business burned down. And that was actually Yahweh, and he admitted after it burned down that he had stolen the money to start it. And, you know, this person went and, ba went and, went and made a baby with that person's wife, or laid down with her and was one flesh, and this bad thing happened to both of them. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're going to hell. It doesn't mean that they're eternally lost, but that was a thing that causes a transition from life to death. Not of everyone, but of some. And it doesn't mean that their whole life evaluation means that they're going going to evil place. And then Yehoshua comes, Jesus comes, and there's no retaliation and there's no right to kill anybody for anything and there's the power to actually raise the dead and heal, which is a good combination. So, the children are already locked up in the midst of things that they know are wrong. And right now, with web speed communications, this is the epidemic problem. You've got a married couple. They're not, they're not having a very good time together. There's a lot of conflict. There's a bad spirit over them. And one person makes friends with somebody online, and when, within three weeks they're convinced that that's really their person, and they've married the wrong person. Um, and they're not, they're not hip to the concept that when you make the vow and the marriage covenant, your actual blood and your genitals and your flow of actual physical life is unified until one of your forms dies, your, your two souls that have been bound together by that vow. And you can get divorced, but you can't get unmarried. If you really study Jesus and the early Christian writings, if you're coming into Christianity, um, if you're in a second marriage or a third marriage, it doesn't mean that you're going to hell or in a fifth marriage. But I'm telling you, you've got to really fight to bend the rules and try and proclaim that Jesus is not calling us to observe first marriage vow. And singleness is a really cool way, and as a gathering together and sharing. All the disciples had everything in common. Nobody considered anything to be their personal own. And they shared with each one another. So that means, you know, and the Romans looked on them and they said, Look at how they care for each other and love each other. So the picture is to be surrounded by tenderness and sweet koinonia, unity, storgia love, family love. Um, and, okay, well, that, if that's not available, let's make it happen. And, you know, if that's not available, well, we're not getting beaten every day and thrown into a jail cell. And we actually have a lot of really nice stuff. Um, I just watched a... Um, a great video, I forgot the title of it, on, on YouTube, on uh, Being Alone, On Being Alone, I think that's the title, On Being Alone, it's a great piece, um, and uh, it's very inspiring. So we sang about the children having hidden things, and if you go to them and say, hey, is there anything that you've done wrong that you really want to talk about and you're tired of carrying on your own? You know, sometimes a child will respond to that. Um, children really need tenderness. Um, I actually had a mother who was afraid of tenderness because there had been incest in her family. I actually had a father who was afraid of tenderness and kept saying to me, I know you think that I treat your sister better than I treat you, because he was going through waves of remorse about, you know, marrying this woman who was pregnant with this kid. And so he did treat her better than me and he was ashamed about that um, so and he would look at me and kind of look away and he was afraid to tell me for 24 years so you know I mean I have a longing for just being hugged and being close to and I have afraid of looking in the eyes of men because that's how my flesh was trained um, so it's really harder for me to address myself to you brother and I'm moving these informations towards the brotherhood you know you've got to learn and got to learn to see it on my
remember the Garden of Eden, dude. Like, I learned from Montauk Chia that, I mean, this is going to get a little bit in the, the uh, you know, gender and sex department, but I learned from Montauk Chia that when the woman has the pleasure moment, she does not lose chi. She loses chi when she uh, ovulates and, and does the cleansing. There are two things that the human body does that takes an enormous amount of caloric energy. One is excreting digestive enzymes. The other is produ producing the, the sexual reproductive cells. Those are two things that you don't think, okay, I'm going to produce more, you know, egg seed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It just happens, and it overrides your blood and your power. Uh, and when Montauk Chia was teaching that, um, it's especially important for uh, men and women to understand that uh, when the man has his pleasure moment, if there is a flow, uh, and there doesn't have to be, because there's different kinds of pleasure moments, um, if he has his flow, he's actually, in the in the Leviticus 15, he's called untouchable for a while, just like the woman is called special or set apart to God. And it's a regeneration moment. Um, and there's actually a life depletion, and that life depletion is returned through the one that loves you constantly through all the phases of your life that you've made a vow with. So if you're with somebody that you don't have a vow with, you're essentially pouring your chi down the gutter, regardless of how nice it might be or how it, you might be hopeful if you're not under the covenant or if you're breaking a covenant. Um, it's, uh, it's more of a loss than it seems. So, being wise and remembering the Garden of Eden, um, where clearly we would be much more simple and innocent like the animal world, and there wouldn't be pain in childbirth. Uh, you don't see bloody menses in the animal world, and you don't see any flow from the man outside of the sweet place where the, the two forms that are actually one form with two parts connect. You've got one form with two different parts and two different directive souls, which is really fascinating. One form, but with two different physical parts and two different individual directive souls. Um, so, the Dorothy Day thing, by little and by little, I discovered this amazing thing about the good battling against the best. Um, and then I discovered the Oswald Chambers thing on the same topic. And it's really neat because, you know, when my daddy decided not to tell me for a really long time that I wasn't his the real dad or the birth dad, he was doing a good thing. He was protecting me. And he's actually protecting himself from discomfort as well. Oswald Chambers, May 25th, is one of my favorite ones. The greatest enemy of the life of faith in God is not sin, but good choices, which are not quite good enough. The good is always the enemy of the best. In this passage, it would seem that the, wa the wisest thing in the world would be for Abraham to do what would, would be for him to choose. It was his right to choose, and the people around him would consider him to be a fool for not just choosing. Many of us do not continue to grow spiritually because we prefer to choose on the basis of our rights. I have every right to have a pleasurable experience. My marriage is not a pleasurable experience, so therefore I divorce and I remarry. It's better to just remain in the ecstasy of the blessed community, but it's not easy. So if we choose on the basis of our rights instead of relying on God to make the choice for us, that's a trouble. We have to learn a walk, to walk according to the standard 
which has its eyes focused on God, who is an actual creative person and does strange response and creative things that we would not be able to plan. The scripture is actually um, where Abraham and Lot separate. They've got so much stuff that they've got to separate. Stuff separates people. And uh, they've got to go in two different directions. And Abram says, if you take the left path, then I'll go to the right path. Or if you go to the right path, then I will go to the left path. Basically, he's backing up and allowing Lot to make the first choice so that there's no conflict. And it's interesting, the same thing is going on in this whole estate thing. Um, you know, if someone chooses one way, I will be comfortable and take what is rema the remaining way. And then Oswald writes, or actually Biddy, his wife, put these together. She's so great. Without the woman, we would not know Oswald Chambers. Praise God for Margaret Fell. As soon as you begin to live the life of faith in God, fascinating and physically gratifying possibilities will open up before you, like Jesus being tempted in the desert. Exactly. He's got full of the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden he's got a test. These things are yours by right, these gratifying things, these fascinating things. They're yours by right. But if you are living the life of faith, you will exercise the right to waive your rights and let God make your choice for you. I have every right to have the kind of pleasure that I decide that I want or that I feel the most acclimated to. If you're living the life of faith, you will exercise your right to waive your rights and you will let God make your choice for you. God sometimes allows you to get into a place of testing where your own welfare would be the appropriate thing to consider. If you were not living the life of faith, that is. But if you are living the life of faith, you will joyfully waive your right and allow God to make your choice for you. Back up. This is the discipline that God uses to transform the natural into the spiritual through obedience to his voice. Whenever our right becomes the guiding factor in our lives, it dulls our spiritual insight. The greatest enemy of the life of faith in God is not sin, but good choices which are not quite good enough. So, if we have a right, I have every right to put off talking about an uncomfortable thing. That was, the, that was the sound of our family. I mean, that was the essence of our families. Putting off, dealing with difficult things. I think it's part of the reason why I was so bad at homework. Actually, I liked homework, but I was always so engaged in whatever I was connected with at the moment, and still am. Okay, uh, by little and by little, the selected writings of Dorothy Day. Now, Dorothy Day made some moves that I would not want anyone to follow, and she made many other moves that would be great for people to follow. Um, so let's know the, the words of Yeshua first, and read them. Archbishop Robichaud, in his book Holiness for All, emphasizes the fact, this is Dorothy Day writing, this is a favorite portion of hers. Archbishop Robichaud, in his book Holiness for All, emphasizes the fact that the choice is not between good and evil for the devoted, for Christians. That it is not in this way that one proves one's love. It's not a choosing between good and evil. The very fact of bap baptism, of becoming children of God, presupposes development as children of God. In other words, you are a child of God. C.S. Lewis points out that the child in the mother's womb would perhaps refuse to be born if given the choice, but it does not have that choice. It has to be born, that child in the womb. The egg has to develop into the chicken with wings. 
otherwise it becomes a rotten egg. It is not between the good and the evil that the choice lies, but between the good and the better, or the best. In other words, we must give up over and over again even the good and pleasant things of this world to choose God. And everybody benefits when we do it. Everybody benefits when we choose God rather than the good things of this world. I mean, there are people who haven't discovered God and haven't heard or seen, haven't had the benefit of having the stuff of God spread out before them. Wherever they are, fine. But if we know, we should choose. Mortal sin is a turning from God and turning toward created and pleasant things. Created things that are good. It is so tremendous an idea turning to created things that are good and nice. It is so tremendous an idea that it is hard for people to see its implications. Our whole literature, our culture is built on ethics. The choice between good and evil. The drama of the ages is on this theme. We are still living in the Old Testament with commandments as to the natural law. This person has a right to have this or that and da da da. We have not yet begun to live as good Jews, let alone good Christians. We do not tithe ourselves. There is no year of Jubilee where we cancel everything. We do not keep a Sabbath. We have lost the concept of true hospitality. It is dog eat dog. We are all hunting whales. We devour each other in love and in hate. We are cannibals. In all secular literature, it has been so difficult to pr portray the good man, the saint, that Don Quixote is made a fool, and Pr Prince Mishkin uh, in Dostoevsky is an epileptic in order to arouse the sympathy of the reader who is appalled by unrelieved goodness in the character. There are, of course, the lives of the saints, but they are too often written as though they were not in the world and not ordinary people. We, seldom, we have seldom been given the saints as they really were, commercial fishermen, you know, people with problems, as they affected the lives of their times. Too little has been stressed on the idea that all are called. Too little attention has been placed on the idea of mass conversions. We have sinned against the virtue of hope. There have been, in these days, mass conversions to Nazism and fascism and political profiles. Where are our saints to call the masses to God? Personalists first. We must put the question to ourselves. Communitarians, we will find Christ in our brothers and sisters. Christ, not a cause. So that was page 216 of By Little and By Little that talks about the good warring against the best. And then when you go to Joshua chapter 7 and read the story about Achan, whose sin actually affected the entire family, immense thousands of thousands and thousands of people were affected. 38 people actually died just because one person decided to do what was kind of pleasant, but they knew was wrong, and they just kind of, well, they just did it. Whatever. They did it. You know, it wasn't really the best thing. It probably, I don't know how I'm going to, I mean, the guy, like, grabbed a cool little sliver of gold and a and some other stuff that he wasn't supposed to touch. And um, he knew that, like, he really couldn't get away with it, and it really wasn't going to work out just fine in the end, because he knew the command. He knew what the bottom line was. But he just did it. And it affected everybody. People don't realize that our choice 
not to choose the best ends up causing people who don't have any hope at all not to get hope. I mean, imagine if your not choosing God caused a person not to finish writing their book or not to not to do their CD so that people could actually be touched by waves of hope that would never be touched because each of us are going to reach people that nobody else could reach. I mean, I was buddies with you 2 when I was a youngster and an early fan and got to hang out with them a little bit. And, um, you know, everybody in this world does not know the band U2, but they have truly touched many people in what they've done. And that's like, you know, a regular worldly secular example. What if somebody's, you know, error had caused them not to come together? That's a picture of what happens when you start playing with disobedience to God. Picture like all the people that have ever listened to you 2 never hearing that sound of that music and being inspired and up, uplifted enjoying it some. That's like a picture of all the people that would be lost or extremely more burdened or even give up on God because one person has been stifled from going forward. And I'll tell you, it is the kindest men, brothers, it is you kind ones that will be caught and bound and held back. Because Jesus says, let your gentleness be evident to all. And there's lots and lots of nasty, prideful preachers out there who want to ignore this part of the scriptures or that part of the scriptures or this way of life or that way of life. And you ones who are willing to be humble and strong and hold on to the whole thing. Go after scrollpublishing.com and find out what the early Christians did and spice your spirit-led life up with the stuff of the early Christians. That is a great balance. Spirit-filled life stuff. Study on spiritual warfare and demons. There's some great websites out there. Remember, there's a bunch of demon groupings. There's demon groupings around money and pride. There's demon groupings around beauty and attractiveness. There's demon groupings around family. And even the physical pleasure things actually move in directions to trap people and ruin families and cause kids to be depressed and commit suicide and get confused. I mean, there are packs of spirits that just want people to be ruined and die. But remember, the eternal spirit of Yahweh inside of you is immense, immensely larger than any negative, dark, or troubling spirit. And there's an uncountable number of spirits. Only one-third of those spirits fell. So that means there's two-thirds of angels of light. You angels of light, go and help out those people that watch this thing from the very warm and stuffy little garret room. And... Today is like the Confession and Communion Day. Today is the day where, you know, we put our stuff out before our closest posse and go over the things that have really been, you know, the, the leash that drags us into darkness and um, just work these things over and get current, not just on one topic, but on many. And um, it's interesting, I found this recently. It says, this is a treasure... And in this, um, actually one of the first things that you can do when you discover that God is real is you can start making lists. That's actually a box of lists of wicked things that we chose to do in our, it was a family group that we were in. And we actually chose to sit down and think about and talk about the marker like evil or wicked things that we had done in our youth and through the years that are under the blood of Jesus now, but that are a really good marker because they are washed away, they're covered over, um, but just like the Israelites would put a big pile of rocks where something strange or difficult would happen. So when the kids walked by, they would say, what's that pile of rocks? And I said, well, uh, Achan and his family had done a thing that actually ruined the whole 
tribe and many many people died and that was where all of his stuff and he and his extended family was burned um, or buried under a pile of rocks and that is not the way of God now precisely but if you know where cancer comes from and you can discover the roots of the cancer and you can if you can ask the Holy Spirit you will be pretty flippin surprised I mean to sit there and be helping my mother and in my spirit hearing my actual part of a root of this problem was pretty intense and you know I mean people can say oh he's loopy he's out of his mind he's this and that etc cetera, etc cetera. that's fine they can do that but um, I mean what if okay brothers what if um, in your worst shortcoming whether it's screaming at somebody or being prideful or spending too much money greedy in your business or um, whatever chasing what's wrong or sex and wrong or something like that I mean imagine when you chose to do that you were like partially amputating one of your children's legs you know I mean there's um, there's patience and there's beauty there's silver in the <laughs> there's beauty in that silver singing river uh, but there's Ananias and Sapphira Acts chapter 5 so receive the freshness of the Holy Spirit and understand that you do it is wise to get in relationship with Yahweh and Yeshua learn how to do it man chase down stuff get in contact and make your lists, make your sin lists, make a list of people that you really need to get right with make a list of memories that you have of just horrible deeds that if you had had parents that were in the city of wholeness you could have gone and said you know what I the darkness ran my life yesterday I don't know how this happened maybe like you said mom maybe like you said pop sometimes these things happen just so it can be made for a testimony to warn and help other people I don't know but it sure is scary and and I'm so scared and somebody's got to help me because I don't know how to change or deal with this one and in Dorothy Day's life it's interesting because when Jesus says not one stroke of the pen of the law will pass away until all things are fulfilled he's actually meaning that the heart of God in the law in the covenant first covenant the heart of God is seen as kind and protective a loving parent it's like hey guess what if you do this thing I'm gonna call the cops on you and you're gonna get locked up or you know there's gonna be a consequence so people stop and they think twice about whether they want something really nasty to happen and then some people get so calloused that they just you know they're so stuck in hiding things that um, you know they know they're heading towards another disaster and that gets rough so that's why we come together for communion and conversation on Thursday and on Saturday night Sunday sunrise like that uh, God gave a, an outline for a schedule. Two, two worship parties or agape feasts a month, uh, which is you know public gathering. Invite people over, tell them you know hang out with us. You don't have to believe the way we believe, but you will hear God and get revelation on stuff. Um, and three little one-hour Bible studies per week, and two uh, honesty meal times where the people that are dead serious, like Peter, James, and John, you know the ones that have no unbelief that are willing to jump off the cliff and just chase God um, just get current and stay clear about stuff that uh, that are concerns in their lives
Bos Balanimda Kodovalo. And it appears that since the evening sacrifice in the Temple of Israel is when the confessions were, because the day ended at sundown, that day ends, you know. The world started with darkness and then there was light. So that's why the day begins with darkness and then halfway through the 24 hour zone there's light. But the evening sacrifice is has the confession of sins in it. So confession and communion at sundown, beginning the day, seems like a practice that was going on in the early church gathering, or maybe confession at noon, probably communion at noon time, but at confession time at sundown. Which is a cool thing to do as a family. It's like, okay, is there anything that like just happened that was awful? Um, I mean, to clear away time in the morning and in the evening to have a corporate devotion is awesome. It says in the book of Acts, they met daily from house to house and in public places. That's not a building with a name on it. That's like parks and farms and workplaces and marketplaces and things like that. So peace be with you, shalom. Do remember that there are children all around you that are carrying things that they would be so... their souls would be lightened if they could actually talk about the things that they're doing wrong that they know they probably shouldn't be doing. And giving them help to get out of those things is great, but first they have to see an example. So brothers, you know, you have the most hidden part of the family human anatomy and because of that you tend to hide things. Well guess what? In Leviticus 15, even that wasn't hidden, it was communicated about to the family. You can read that stuff to figure out what I mean on that. But um, when you take a stand and go forward and really spread out the truth of your life, brothers, then the women and children have peace. They really do. They become happy. Want the best things, guys. Come on. Want the best things. Want the vow to surround the two forms and remain until one of those two forms passes away because they become one form through the vow and the connecting physically and the visible agreement with the community and the celebration. There's four things. And the celebration, often the celebration, the party, is the only thing that people really focus on. When the community looks in around you, they say, we actually want you to be together. <laughs> we want to help you remain together. What can we do for you? We love you. You're beautiful together. Look at how nice your babies are. Yay! To have a longing to have the face of God. Like in the Garden of Eden, where there's no pain and no confusion. There's no worry about money. There's no worry about this and that, etc., etc., etc. Is a high calling for a man and a high calling for a woman. When the woman's longing is more to see the sparkly eyes, like God's eyes, that have come from the blood of her man, alive on the earth and changing the world in a beautiful way in a beautiful way that they can actually not just blend with the world but be what transforms the world. We are salt and light. Salt is a preservative. Light is something that causes darkness not to exist anymore. Remember John 3, 19-21. The, the the verdict is this, the challenge is this, that light has come into the world and human beings did not accept the light because they knew that were de their deeds were evil and they didn't want to be exposed. They didn't want to become vulnerable. But the ones who love the ways of truth come into the light even with their wicked deeds knowing that everything has been done with God watching anyway 
and that's John 19 to 21. It's good to read that over and over again. Write it down. That's a great memory scripture. That is one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. So the whole Bible. That one and John 15, 16 and Acts 3, 19 and John 8, 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold on to my information, my teachings, and walk in my teachings, then you're my disciples. He's implying you can believe in me and kind of join my bandwagon, but not be my disciples in your heart. And if you, by following and walking in my teachings, become my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So don't let anybody fluff around with that thing and say, oh, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. He's saying, if you believe in me, Messiah, Yehoshua. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you know, you can play with that scripture if you want to, but if, when you really read it in context, it is the Son of God speaking and demanding that people not just get on the little bandwagon and wear the Christian t-shirt, but they actually learn and walk in his ways. And I've got a long way to go do those things and if you listen to all of this that's really awesome brothers be great dads be great helpers of families please be an encouragement to the women tell the women hey you're the last and most beautiful part of all creation hey you are El Shaddai in a physical human form God the lactating mommy breast who's nurturing and wonderful and just beyond description and is perfect and is the only one that knows how to shut us up and you are, you've got Racham and Rachem inside of you, woman. My daughter, young, young daughter, you have Racham and Rachem in you. You have womb and you have mercy. And those are highest attributes of God. God is the originating place and God is the place where mercy and kindness comes to even somebody that's fussy and negative and bad that doesn't even deserve niceness. God is the one who is nice even to the ones that don't deserve any niceness. And also remember... Isha and Isha, Jesus became Isha, the pierced, for us. It's interesting, the man is called the pointed and the woman is called the pierced. And in Hebrew, you're not allowed to pierce a person in death. And isn't it weird that it says, Yeshua, Jesus, Messiah, became the pierced in order that we be born. And then they poked him in the side and out came water and blood, which is what it comes out when a baby is born. You know, it's really cool. So, I mean, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit and he makes us into like a mother, a tender mother who cares for people and helps to nurture them. So, brothers, let the women know these things. These are the solid things. When the women know that they are like the last and most beautiful part of all creation before Jesus, and when they walk in the room and they're even silent in the room, the men feel better and the children feel better. And it's not because of some wrong desire. It's just because their souls that are equal to us put in the form that we all appreciate as like the nurture, the loving kindness of God. And God is above gender. God is gender designer. And we don't say the Holy Spirit, He. And we don't say that God is a physical male human being that we're calling Daddy but we're just expressing storgia, family love. You love us. You have, you're infatuated with us like a little child. And I don't know what it's like to be infatuated with my own little baby child. And someday I will, maybe, but maybe not. Thus ends 48 minutes of film.